on. We'll move on to a, a very. We'll move on to a very different, different subject now. Um, Dr. Christian Lutzenitz is um, the David Snellgrove Senior Lecturer in Tibetan and Buddhist Art here at um, at SOAS. Um, his research focuses on Buddhist art of India and Tibet, and he's extensively published on Gandhara and Western Himalayan and early Tibetan art and has curated a number of exhibitions. Our email correspondence, when I was trying to persuade him to talk, was interrupted for a month while he was completely out of email range and reception, which doesn't happen in many parts of the world. That was in Mustang. I will restrain from asking you if you know where that is. Um, he's published, um, as I say, a lot on, on these things, and he's talking to us today about challenges, opportunities and discoveries, the Tibetan Buddhist Monastery Collections in Mustang. Christian, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. How do we get the slides on this? <laughs> Good question. I think that's... Is this... Ah. That's me. <laughs> No, we'll have to work this out. Poppy had it set up for you. If you, go, you were loaded up somewhere. There we are. That's it. Okay. Yeah, that's you. Okay. Uh, perfect. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I just was in Mustang in summer and I will. Uh, explain immediately where that is. Uh, it's in Nepal, it's a Tibetan speaking area in northern Nepal and what you see here is uh, a map of Nepal uh, from Google with Kathmandu being the central one and then uh, west of it what is called uh, western uh, Nepal uh, is the area where Mustang belongs to, and that's immediately in north of that. You, do you see that? Yes, up here. We'll zoom in in this, and I think one, one thing one has to be aware is this is the only valley that cuts straight north-south through the Himalayas, yeah? And so there is a huge river uh, gorge uh, in that area, and on one side you have the Annapurna Mountains and on the other side you have the Daulagiri Mountains, so two 8,000 mountain ranges uh, between. And, but the direct connection made it an ideal uh, area for trade and that trade is partly responsible for the heritage that I'm documenting there. Uh, here you can see a little airport and from here opens up a valley, a high plateau valley, uh, which is restricted from approximately uh, this area. Uh, it's relatively famous among people who are interested in the Himalayas because uh, of uh, its scenery, for example. Uh, it's kind of beautiful villages that you can track from one uh, to another. It's, some go there for wildlife, especially snow leopards, but I, you don't see them uh, on, on art historical field research, but you may see vultures or blue sheep. And some go there for adventure, even if they have to essentially carry uh, their bikes up the mountain pass. In its center, it, it's centered on uh, a, a village, essentially a fortified village, the fortification of which goes back uh, to the 15th century. And in the 15th century and in the 16th century, uh, there was a little kingdom that essentially organized or, or, or controlled trade between the Himalayas and the Indian Plains from there. And that surplus allowed them to build major monuments. Yeah? The city is called uh, Lomantang. And in Lomantang, there are two major uh, large temples that are famous, uh, like this one, the Champala Kang, with a, a big sculpture of Maitreya. It's an early 
uh, 15th century construction and a slightly later construction. And what is outstanding for them, for this remote region, is their size. They are uh, substantial, uh, of substantial size. And you can usually see that in Tibetan architecture by, on the basis of the number of pillars they have <laughs> in, inside the hall, which of course is part of the kind of construction technique. Uh, and they preserve excellent uh, murals, as we can see here. There is also one exceptional uh, monument that uh, many visitors would like to see when they go to Mustang. It's called Luri. And it's, uh, you see the, the red building, and above the red building is a little window, and so essentially it's in there. <laughs> uh, which is a kind of painted, probably a funerary chapel with a stupa in the center, but the entire cave uh, painted out in very, very high quality of the 14th century or even late 13th century. And then people go there for festivals. Yeah? When I, uh, especially the, the Tichi festival in spring, or then the kind of horse riding is, of course, an old tradition in any Tibetan area. Uh, I, however, go there for monastery collections <laughs> uh, to essentially document uh, monastery collections. And this is one of, of uh, the objects that was documented there. And it, it uh, shows a, a god of wealth uh, called Vaishravana. And even if you may not, or if you're not familiar at all with, with sculptures of that type, uh, I think the quality of the piece uh, is undeniable, especially with the silver and copper inlay uh, that we see on this particular object. And just to give a reference, and that explains why I'm kind of doing a project there, is... Uh, if you would sell an object like this in Asian art in London, uh, for example, at an auction that took place this week, it's definitely more than half a million dollars. Uh, even higher, considerably higher than that. And so you can imagine that these are very valuable, very high, uh, valuable objects uh, abroad. And Mustang is uh, stunning in the sense that they have uh, relatively much of those objects because the kingdom was so rich. Uh, and I'll just show you one example. Namgyel Monastery, which is not too far from Lomandang. Here is the fortified city we saw before. Here is the, the monastery, around 20, 25 minutes walk uh, from there. In 2010, it still looked like this with an older structure. Uh, and within the main temple, uh, you see that the, the more precious metal objects are in, behind glass in the altar. And the, the less precious ones sit outside. I'm also documenting the books, which go back to the 14th century, uh, partially. And here are the, the, the sculptures in the, in the altar. And one of the, the, because there are so many high quality objects, I created this research project, uh, Tibetan Buddhist Monastery Collections Today. And what I'm kind of talking now is more some of the, the re reasons for doing it, the challenges uh, that, that uh, one faces and but also the opportunities and discoveries that one makes. If I want to single out some of the challenges, access is one, documentation another one, and management a third uh, that I want to talk about. And in this connection, access is extremely important because there is essentially a, a similar thing happen all across the Himalayan range, but in many other areas as well. As soon as a region is open for tourism, and many of these regions were opened only in the 70s, 
1980s, you could go there for the first time without uh, special permission from the government. Uh, so people knowledgeable in, in the quality of art in the objects may take photos from them. Some of them, not necessarily with good intentions, but they decide, oh, this is a precious object. Uh, it would be great to have it. <laughs> Uh, and so what is usually happening that photography is used to commission theft because uh, theft can al always be easier done by locals than by foreigners and that essentially happened in all the Himalayan regions in the first years after uh, their opening to tourism. The result of that is once thefts occur, objects get hidden. Uh, Photography gets prohibited. If then a theft occurs, still, <laughs> uh, there is no way they can prove the ownership, yeah? that they ever owned the object. Uh, and so what, that's where my project jumps in and tries to document and create inventories for those monasteries that they have them themselves and they can prove the ownership. But of course, the difficulty in this vicious circle is I first have to break the, 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 the prohibition for photo photography <laughs> because without proper photography, there is no, no way that they can uh, prove that they own a certain object. And so it's a, it's a long matter of negotiation and uh, to try uh, to get access. And in Namgyal, I was quite uh, lucky with this uh, very adventurous abbot uh, who also completely rebuilds his monastery uh, as we can see in the background at the same time. But he actually uh, allowed access. Documentation is another problem. We'll just heard this is a region where I can't be reached by email. <laughs> uh, it's also a region where there is no permanent electricity. <laughs> Uh, so you essentially have to apply uh, or bring your equipment and if you're lucky, you have a few hours of electricity in, in the evening to recharge it and so you, you essentially have to improvise your little photo studio in every uh, space that you come in. Uh, and obviously then you have, uh, these objects have to be brought out and looked at, measured, and uh, documented. And in this case, of course, once I have access, the documentation is very comprehensive. It takes it from all sides and also uh, from the bottom. Uh, the bottom sometimes is interesting because it's, you can see if its uh, seal is actually whatever, the original one, or had to be replaced at one stage. Or books. Uh, sometimes documented as objects, just with the beginning and the end of the actual manuscript. Some we documented in full pages, so essentially every uh, page, which is sound amounts, of course, uh, in a documentation that sums up to something like, it's actually today 28,000 photographs from Namgyal alone. <laughs> from because of the many uh, books that we uh, documented there as well. One of the, the, the challenges that uh, one may be less aware of is that my in intervention, so to speak, with trying to document results in, hand, in, in, in special handling of the objects, which essentially means that they uh, take it out, but these are not people who are used to handling objects uh, or do this carefully uh, or have been trained in any, any way. So, so if you would compare that with whatever precious objects in the museum and how they are handled, that's quite a different uh, matter. Uh, accordingly, they also have religious value and for example, this very ugly repainting of the face that you see, that happened between 2010 and 2012. And it's a, a, an, a religious act that you finance for merit the repainting of the faces of the images. Uh, sadly, the donor did not consider that the 
the, the person who did the job actually couldn't paint. <laughs> and the colors that they were used were actually inappropriate for, uh, they were modern uh, kind of lacquer colors. It may also happen to you that the, the, the abbot finds one piece so interesting that he wants to find out what's inside. <laughs> So in, the, in this case, he just opened up everything uh, and started to look at everything, read little inscriptions, what's, what was inside the box. <laughs> uh, it gave me the chance to photograph the, uh, the inside as well, but obviously that wasn't the intention. <laughs> so so the, what, what you trigger, you may not always know or have control about what you uh, trigger. The Opportunities of that material is uh, uh, vast for, from, from a research perspective. First of all, of course, it's a huge amount of new material that you may document. But much more important is the, that they have a context. In contrast to objects in Western museums that we don't really know how they came and here and where they came from, there you have a bulk that uh, has a context and that context uh, informs you about the piece in, in, in ways that you uh, may not expect immediately. There are also curious objects that may simply be new like uh, stupas that you can open up uh, or lineages that are inscribed with the donor and that you can essentially uh, place in time so they actually belong to sets. And that's another uh, important uh, detail, that essentially very often artworks are not considered, or, or sculpture is not donated alone. Yeah? Uh, but in Western Museum, it may end up alone. <laughs> yeah? But in actually in the original context, you, it's part of a set. And it's the, part, it's the different pieces of the set that communicate together that actually give you and provide you much more information about uh, the object. Here it's a triad that belongs together. If they would be sold here, they would be split up and you would find them in three different museums and it would be extremely hard uh, to reconstruct that they originally belonged uh, together. And then, of course, the West is very often interested in bronze sculpture and other precious materials rather than, for example, clay <laughs> or papier mache or stuff like that. So, so there is a lot of material or, or uh, objects in other materials that uh, can be documented. And some of them as these ones of quite stunning quality, but of course, many of them also of lesser quality and, also, and they also have suffered over time. But all together, of course, uh, form a much more comprehensive picture of the history of the region. Uh, the context is also important uh, of the objects because not only because they form sets, but sometimes an object may actually tell you much more than you expect, like in this case, the dome of that particular stupa was a drinking cup made in the Chinese imperial court first. And so it tells you about the connections of the region to the Chinese court at that time. It also connects it to the West Tibetan region by the shape of the different stupas here. And uh, you get uh, sculptures of people about whom you can read that they were involved in the historical affairs of, of, the, of the place in historic times. So, so you, again, you, you have a much more contextual uh, relationship uh, with it. Another important opportunity is that the project alone, despite kind of bringing in a certain risk for the object, it also helps in awareness building. In many cases, the abbots of the places didn't know what they have. <laughs> and uh, documenting it for them and uh, creating inventories essentially makes them aware of what they have. And it, this becomes more important as 
the more the, the region opens up. And uh, it's only three years ago that the first kind of cheapable road was finished uh, to, the, to the upper regions of the valley. So, and uh, obviously the modernity uh, sets in through that, also visible at Namgyal Monastery itself, which was essentially demolished in 2012 and is now being rebuilt in concrete, <laughs> which uh, is of course a kind of, uh, yeah, that's the, already the reconstruction of the temple that uh, the, the final blow for the temple was a damage in the earthquake of 2015. Among the discoveries, there are uh, a huge amount of them. Uh, especially the, the uh, manuscripts uh, were, first of all, the sets of sculptures were extremely interesting. Uh, and there are some features which we probably would have a hard time to find out uh, on, if we wouldn't have uh, the documentation of the objects on site. Here, for example, one has a lineage uh, of figures that belong uh, together to a set, but essentially the deities and the Tibetan uh, figures, this one or this one, are done in a different alloy than the Indian figures. Yeah? Those that are historically Indian are done in a dark alloy. And, and, but still they belong to the same set. And so there, there is a kind of attempt to differentiate between the two uh, through the color of the alloy. And we found that in the second set as well, but we couldn't really, yeah, that's, that's not as complete as this one in Namgyal. In Namgyal, we also found a 14th century uh, collection of manuscripts uh, that precedes essentially the formulation of a Buddhist canon in Tibet. Uh, that's depicted here with uh, quite well preserved book covers painted in a unique manner on the inside. And as you can see from this detail, it's a kind of a relief painting that I haven't seen before I documented this area. So it's essentially the, the lines are in relief coming out of the surface and uh, the rest is all uh, gilded. That's the bottom cover. Uh, these covers are very often very richly decorated as you can see here. Uh, that's a, a part of Buddhist culture is of course to donate uh, precious books to, and to make them as precious as possible, uh, especially a certain type of literature. Uh, they are also fairly large size and very often the first volume and what we see here is the volume signature uh, and the, the content signature uh, is uh, very richly uh, decorated. And some may have even uh, more elaborate uh, themes on it. Not everything is as well preserved because you have to imagine that these were essentially attached to the manuscript itself. They were rubbed whenever they were used. Uh, so the usage essentially affects the, the preservation of these objects. Uh, that's the complete cover uh, showing the Buddha with different audiences. Uh, and surrounded by the Buddhas of the ten directions around him. Uh, probably the most uh, surprising one was that there was an earlier set that looked much uh, simpler, as we can see here, with relatively simple covers, but then with illuminations, and actually an illumination program that is planned through an entire section. So for example, through 
30 volumes, and we have a lot of that in later period, but this is the, the earliest example of such an iconographic program in a, a, a section or a collection of manuscripts. And so here we'll have some details of the life of the Buddha uh, here in, in heaven before his actual rebirth, where he anoints his successor, uh, Maitreya, who now uh, lives in that heaven. And again, it's a huge amount of uh, material, and here it just gives you an idea of, of that particular 14th century collections that we documented 42 volumes, uh, of which only two are missing in this case, uh, which haven't been documented before uh, or even known uh, before. And of course, there are many other manuscripts of uh, precious or high quality that with illuminations that you find in that collection. Altogether, we have documented by now 120 manuscripts from that particular uh, place alone. Uh, one also may find completely unexpected objects like this one, a scroll that is uh, beautifully painted on one side with goddesses, dancing goddesses, symbols, on the other side with uh, kind of a stylized uh, ring of fire in different color and a vajras. So this was, and we have a second object of that. Nothing of that is known from Western collections, but it probably has been used on the outskirts of a mandala, kind of standing as part of the decoration uh, at certain ritual locations. And the flames then would be on the outside kind of as protection and the paintings would be directed towards the inside uh, of that particular uh, mandala that is temporary. And the quality of the painting is, is quite stunning, even though the, the preservation and the the, the dirt partly on, on uh, the scroll has affected it uh, severely. Here just some details of this particular. And of course what it depicts is channel grounds. Yeah? Very often Buddhist, especially esoteric Buddhism, reminds of, of, the, of, of the impermanence of life. Yeah? And so, so the channel grounds are a very important topic and very often a, a very uh, uh, kind of figuratively uh, depicted topic. And one of the, the things the Himalayan areas are famous for is sky burial. That essentially the dead are, are, are placed uh, on exposed places where vultures can eat them. And that's the only depiction of that that I have found so far. <laughs> uh, that, that, and partly that's, of course, also the case because cremation is not possible because there are no trees growing above 3,500 meter. Trees are very uh, scarce, of course. You may also... <laughs> This, this, guess what, is a museum <laughs> in, in the, the, the local imagination, at least the temporary one. Uh, and even uh, among these, you may find pretty stunning objects, like uh, this one in the middle is actually a thousand years old <laughs> uh, and comes from the western Himalayan region, uh, Kashmir, and yeah, dates between 800 and 1,000. And, and so because they don't really know how to judge the age of these objects, uh, the project will uh, kind of uh, bring that uh, to their awareness and will hope that will uh, kind of make them better protected in future. And so so essentially the, the, the kind of uh, main result, of course, I hope is that by not only documenting one monastery, Namgyal,
but by documenting many that eventually we can also connect the different points together. We can use whatever identified objects in one monument to identify objects in another monument and we can create that and link all this, this information together and eventually kind of display that online as a, a representation of the culture of the place. And uh, in that sense, it's hoped that more, the more public you make something, the more protected it is. Because once everybody can find out where some an object comes from, its market value when it's stolen is zero. <laughs> yeah, you can't, or well, you can only uh, sell it under the hand. And so these are the, the monuments that are documented so far. From this year, I actually would have to add one more. Thank you.